Hello, students. We're in week six of uh, psychology of adult development, and we're going to explore memory this week and next week. Okay. We're going to talk about memory. Um, this is one of my favorite topics uh, in this course. Um, we're going to look at uh, chapter five in your book. And I'm going to present the most important concepts from that chapter uh, that will relate to quiz questions. So you want to take good notes first on this lecture and then read the chapter focusing your selective attention on, uh, on the points that I bring up in this uh, lecture. Okay. Now, a couple of years ago, I had a colleague at Duke University who was doing studies with uh, older adults. And some of those older adults had uh, dementia, while others didn't suffer from that. And they had, uh, you know, kind of clear minds, I suppose. Uh, but if you look at the excerpt on this slide, you're going to see um, language responses from an interview that students at Duke did with this particular older adult. This is just an example. And uh, so if you read through this, you're going to find that this person is a bit confused, right? But it seems that he still has a pretty good memory of what he did earlier in life, okay? So this is an excerpt from an interview, transcript of language from a 90-year-old. He says he's either 89 or 90, he's not sure. Uh, adult male in one of my research studies. Okay, so you can read through this and then make some kind of initial judgments about his memory, okay? Now, what kind of memory processes were involved in recalling that information for that older adult male uh, on the last slide. Think about that. How good was this older adult's memory? Okay, so think about that. As you read through the first few pages of the memory chapter and begin to understand that we kind of have different memory storage units, okay, in our mind, uh, look at that interview transcript on the last slide and try to identify what kinds of memory processes the interview participant produced, okay? I'm going to talk about storage systems here in a minute. So think about what storage system this memory uh, is stored in in this man's brain, okay? Now, next week, you're going to produce a written assignment on memory based on uh, several of these transcripts that I collected in this study from these old, old aged adults, okay? And then you'll write about aspects of memory from a scholarly standpoint on that assignment. But that's next week, okay? That's not this week. This week, we're gonna talk about memory systems primarily, okay? Um, you wanna look in your book and look up these four uh, memory systems, okay? First is sensory memory, what we take in through our senses. Uh, Short-term memory, and I'll talk about that. That's kind of a passive storage system where bits of information kind of sit in that passive storage system and we don't do much with the information. But then we begin to work on it. So that's uh, the beginning of working memory. There's a difference between short-term and in working memory. And then uh, we have a memory system called long-term memory. And there are three subsections or subsystems in long-term memory that we'll uh, discuss, okay? We'll start out with this initial um, kind of uh, passive storage system called sensory memory, all right? Um, a man named Miller in the 1950s, uh, did several experiments that showed that humans have sensory memory, okay? Now, sensory memory, it says on this slide, is really brief. It's really brief, okay? 
So when we look at the world, we pick up visual information, okay? And that's called iconic sensory memory, an icon of what we see, right? And that lasts for about a quarter of a second. Okay. Now, if we think about that for a minute, we see the world in kind of a continuous fashion, like a film strip almost, okay? So if you remember those old reels that films used to be shown on, I don't know if you're familiar with that, uh, the non-digital kind, okay? Uh, you'll see that the, those films are a series of small uh, slides or strips, okay? And they're patched together to show a continuous visual depiction of something or someone, okay? And so we see the world in a continuous fashion by taking little snapshots as we go uh, into our sensory memory and they kind of overlap. They last for about a quarter of a second, right? And now that's why we see uh, the world in a kind of continuous fashion, okay? If you sweep your eyes across your uh, context that you're in right now, you're actually taking little snapshots uh, or icons uh, of the stimuli that you're seeing and you're bringing those into your mind, okay? They overlap and that's why we see the world in a continuous fashion. Even though a quarter of a second is really quick, right? These are little snapshots that we pick up, all right? Uh, now, for sound or auditory information, and this is called echoic sensory memory or echoes, right? Um, that lasts for about three to four seconds. So you're listening to my voice right now, okay? And you're holding that linguistic sound in your mind for about three to four seconds. And my sounds that I produce overlap in your uh, auditory sensory memory, okay? And that's why we hear language and other sounds as a stream of continuous information, okay? Uh, in other words, we hold it in mind for three to four seconds and those three to four seconds uh, snapshots, I suppose, of sound uh, overlap. And that's why language sounds continuous to us, okay? So we're bringing in things through our senses, okay? Our visual sense and our hearing sense, right? And these little snapshots of either visual information or sound information overlap. And that's why we view and we hear the world in a continuous fashion. Okay? Now, if we decide that something we see is important, or if we decide that something we hear is important and we want to uh, bring it into kind of a passive storage system, we bring that information into our short-term memory and it just kind of hangs there, okay? We can hold about seven plus or minus two bits of information in our short-term memory. And so it just kind of sits there in our short-term memory system for about 30 seconds. And if we don't start doing something with those bits of information, those bits just kind of fall out, okay? Or they decay from our short-term memory system. But if we start to rehearse the information, we're going to start to move the information into something called working memory, okay? Because we start to work with the bits of information in order to rehearse and then later retain what we've seen or what we've heard, okay? So working memory has been studied a lot. Um, working memory is a storage system and it's also a processing system, okay? When we begin to process bits of information in that short-term memory storage unit, that's the beginning of working memory. And that's what uh, psychologists call it. 
If you look closely in your textbook on the section that describes Alan Baddeley's model of working memory, uh, that model involves a central processor or a central executive, okay? And that uh, central executive, maybe here in the frontal lobe, pulls information from long-term memory that's stored around your brain and also information about strategies that you use to rehearse information, okay? And also we pull from uh, our minds our, our previous experiences, okay? So we use kind of top-down processes to understand this visual or auditory uh, information that we're working on, okay? And just based on experience, we can kind of classify what we're seeing or what we're hearing based on past experience. So that's why they call it top-down processing, okay? Now, as we get older during adulthood, working memory capacity gets smaller, okay? Um, if you think about it, when we read a book, let's say you're reading a textbook, right? The memory chapter. Um, if you're older, you're going to have to probably go back and reread what you just read in order to start to understand it and retain it, okay? Um, older adults have kind of reduced working memory capacity, and that's why sometimes they have to go back and reread stuff that they've already read in order to hold that in working memory and work with the information so that they can remember it, okay? Now, even uh, as a young person, uh, I often got kind of distracted while I was reading, and then I had to go back and read again, right? Uh, but this is not the same as not having the capacity for the storage space to be able to retain information there, okay? Uh, you know, attention plays a role in this, but as you get older, maybe you don't focus too much on what you're reading or, you know, maybe your thoughts are distracted by other things and that involves inhibition, right? The ability to inhibit uh, irrelevant thoughts or irre irrelevant kinds of uh, stimuli that are coming in and kind of uh, creating havoc in your attention, okay? But uh, working memory reduces over time as one becomes older, and, and so we have to compensate for those things by going back and, say, rereading a passage in a book that we want to remember, okay? Now, what happens after you work on this information and you rehearse it? It has to be stored in a kind of a permanent storage in our brain, okay? Now, we know based on the most recent research that memories are actually stored in the synapses or the, you know, small gaps between neurons in our brain, okay? And they're stored as proteins that have been strengthened. All right, it's interesting. Uh, this is the latest research. And so we store memories all around uh, our brain between the neurons, okay, in proteins. Now, in these uh, permanent storage units, uh, they only become, you know, we only lose long-term memories if we have some brain damage or, or uh, you know, we start to experience dementia or other uh, problems later in life. But we do store this information rather permanently, although memory is often uh, fallible. In other words, uh, we don't, we seem to reconstruct memories as we pull them out and think about them, okay? Um, but anyway, that's another uh, uh, class, I guess. But here we want to talk about uh, the memory systems that are in this long-term permanent storage unit in our brain. We have three systems that have been identified by a man named Endel Tolving in 1972. We have one that's called the episodic system. 
we have one that's called the semantic long-term memory system, and we have a procedural long-term memory system. So these are the three subunits in our long-term storage, okay? What is episodic? Okay, we often think of long-term memories as being autobiographical memories, things, things that we've experienced, right, with other people or in certain contexts that we remember from our lives, okay? So the episodic long-term memory system is, is that system. These are episodes of our lives. If you think of a telenovela or a soap opera that you watch on TV or a Korean drama that comes out in segments, uh, these are episodes that are shown. Well, these are episodes of our lives, okay? So it's called episodic long-term memory. They're self-experienced. Uh, it may be as mundane as what I ate for breakfast this morning, or it may be as uh, important as maybe getting married, or maybe having children, or having experienced the loss of a loved one, okay? We were actually in the memory, and we remember the setting or the context that we were in, and we remember these episodes, okay? That's episodic memory long-term memory okay now we have a system called the semantic long-term memory system who was the first president of the united states you can probably recite that you know in your sleep right uh george washington okay where do we where do we store that information well it's also in the brain we remember facts we remember concepts uh, etc and we know uh, that semantic memory is our knowledge representation system in our long-term store, okay? And so we have networks of knowledge uh, representations, things that we've learned in life, things that we've learned in class, things that we've learned or experienced along the way that have to do with facts or concepts. The third long-term memory system is called procedural, okay? This is your how-to memory, okay? Uh, when you were a child, you learned how to ride a bike, maybe, okay? And it was kind of difficult at first because we were just remembering the knowledge of, you know, what to do, put your foot on the pedal and move it around and put your other foot on the other pedal. And then we were trying to, you know, steer the bicycle, and so it comes in steps, but later on it becomes kind of an automatic uh, thing that you don't even think about, right, when you get on a bicycle. And so the pr procedural long-term memory system has to do with how to do things, okay? How to prepare breakfast, how to cook an egg, how to cook bacon, how to cook sausages, right? Uh, maybe you don't eat those, but you know, these are just coming to mind. Um, you know, how to fill out your taxes, okay? These are things that we kind of learn step by step, but later on, we're able to do them almost automatically, okay? So the procedural long-term memory system starts out being a, a very clunky kind of a system where you learn step by step, but later on, it becomes just automatic, okay? how to drive, how to put on our clothes, okay? It's a relatively automatic system. All right, you want to read in your book how these systems are impacted by aging. The episodic system, the semantic system, and the procedural system over the adult uh, part of the lifespan, okay? All right, uh, there is another type of memory mentioned in your book, and it's not memory for things that have occurred before, but it's memory for things that will occur in the future, okay? Here on the slide, it says, if you see someone and you have a roommate, they may ask you to have your roommate call them at five o'clock this afternoon, okay? For you, this is not a retrospective task based in the past. It is a prospective 
task, okay? A prospective memory task, remembering to do something in the future. How well do you do that? All right, well, read your book and find out about event-based prospective memory and then time-based prospective memory and how they are impacted by aging. Okay, that may be a question on your quiz. Okay, so we have a quiz and we have a discussion this week. So get those done. And then after this week, we're going to continue with a memory assignment next week. Okay. All right, everyone take care. Have a good week. And I'll see you next